Thank you, Sadia. Thank you so much. Um, and hello again, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to log in with us today. We really do appreciate you doing so. To talk a little bit about the potential for um, higher learning and uh, maybe the costs of it, I will hopefully give you some resources and some websites. We'll watch a couple little short videos. Um, and I promise I'm not gonna keep you past the hour that we are allotted tonight. So um, with that, we're gonna go ahead. Oh, Go ahead and get started, yes. Um, so a little bit about what we'll talk about. Um, we'll really kind of start off by talking about assessing our likes and our dislikes and our values, as well as focus obviously on some options to pay for school. So the US Department of Labor has an awesome website that has many options for you to look at, but for the uh, interest assessment, which I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, which I'm actually going to show you here, hopefully, um, is the Career uh, One Stop uh, website. So um, that's, again, the careeronestop.org. It's Get My Future. If you go, go into the uh, Find a Career I Like, there's a very, very cool um, assessment here. It's uh, 30 pretty quick questions. It takes about five minutes. They even tell you that here on their website. Um, and it really is uh, quick enough. What I do like to uh, stress to people is that, you know, whether, whether this is for, whether you're a parent and, and you're looking to uh, see what it is you need to do to prepare for your younger student uh, going to school, or whether you are currently a uh, student, maybe a high schooler, and you're thinking about going to college and wondering how you're gonna pay for that and where you should start, this assessment is a wonderful, wonderful starting point. Uh, because for many of us, um, you know, when we're in high school, when we're 14, 15, and 16, we may not necessarily know what we want to do. We may not even necessarily know what we're interested in. Um, and that's a huge part of really deciding where we're going to go to college, right? So we may just be thinking, need to go to college, but you really do need to assess um, you know, what you like doing, what are your interests, what are you looking to, to do with the rest of your life? And for, for some of us, that may take a few years, um, even more years after we graduate from high school, and that's okay. Uh, what we really want to focus on is really learning about ourselves a little bit, um, because the last thing that you want to do is go to college and have thousands and thousands of dollars and maybe student loan debt, uh, and decide that that's not for you, and you want to, you know, switch your career options to something totally different. Um, you know, that may uh, also get you to, um, you know, much larger student loan debt, which obviously we want to try to avoid. So taking an interest assessment, much like this one that you see on your screen here, um, can make a huge difference for you. And really think about each and every one of these questions as you go through. Obviously, steering clear from the unsures there in the middle will give you much better um, end result. But if we go through and just kind of click some of these um, at random here, uh, again, you wanna make sure to take the time to go through this assessment and you know really uh, think about each one of these questions, you know, building cabinets compared to writing a book or a novel uh, can, you know, those are two very, very different things. So really thinking about each and every one of these questions, not just kind of going through it as I'm doing now, um, can certainly make a difference. What I want to show you is the assessment at the end um, will look like this. And as you can tell here, it gives you your matches. So your best matches based on your answers, great matches based on your answers, and then just good um, matches based on your answers. But as you can see here, um, it goes through and gives you all of the best matches. So they found 114 career matches um, that match your interests. Uh, it goes as far as giving you the hourly wages, what kind of education and um, certificate you might need, and what the outlook of that particular uh, career looks like. Whereas, you know, an acute care nurse, the outlook for that is bright, meaning 
Um, we're going to need acute care nurses for, for some time here. Whereas if you decided to be an atmospheric earth marine and space science teacher, um, that is below average, meaning there's not going to be a whole lot of need for that particular career anymore. And as you can see, there's no data available for the hourly wages, very likely that this um, is, is very, very close to fading out. So this is a really, really great place to start to give you an idea of not only um, the variety of careers that are available to you based on your interests, but also obviously the type of wages that you might be able to expect, and more importantly, the type of degree that you might need. So, uh, you know, a bachelor's versus uh, a doctrine um, can be huge. Um, you know, many people, I like to give the example, many people don't realize that, you know, maybe, maybe being an airline pilot does not necessarily um, tell you that you need a four-year degree in college. Um, most airline pilots are high school graduates and maybe just went to a trade school as well. Uh, you know, that's a career that tends to be very high paying, tends to be, um, obviously has a lot of responsibility that goes along with it, but it's a career that you may not necessarily have to go to a university for or a four-year college. So that's what this assessment is really going to do for you. It's really going to try to um, you know, maybe expand your view on what you may or may not want to do in the future. So Career One Stop is a wonderful, wonderful website to kind of go into, check out all sorts of different assessments um, that you can do uh, and, and really kind of determine what your interests are and what some of those values, um, you know, that, that you have might steer you towards. All right, so um, regardless of where your path take you, takes you, it's gonna take money. Um, and so that's kind of what we're gonna focus on today. So while there are major factors that will affect the cost of your college or the university that you decide to attend, um, you know, there's, there's a maraud of very small fees and amounts that are quickly gonna add up as well that you should also take into account. So um, like I said, the, the, what you see here on your screen, you know, location, obviously, you know, what kind of career you're going to choose, whether you get any scholarships and grants and the type of school that you go to certainly are going to have a huge effect on the cost of that school that you, that you decide to go to. But you also want to think about things like travel. Um, because one of the very first things that you want to do is put together a budget. So if you don't already have a budget, you need a budget and you need a budget particularly for college um, because you want to make sure to include those costs like travel that many of us may not think about. But if you are attending a uh, college or university outside of your hometown, there may be several trips that you are required to take before school even begins. Um, so, you know, thinking about those types of things, you know, yes, you may be able to find a great deal on an airline ticket, but if you need to go to visit that school two and three times before you actually go to school, um, that can really add up. Application fees are another thing that, you know, some of us may not think about. Uh, most colleges have fees for submitting an application. Usually these run, um, you know, about $50 or so, but some of those, um, you know, more elite schools, you know, Stanford, Duke University, those types can be upwards of $100 each. So depending on how many applications you submit, that can again run into hundreds of dollars. If you don't take that into account, it can really kind of mess with your, with your budget. Um, tests and transferring transcripts, you know, maybe seeking advice or support may all also have additional costs depending on the school. So, um, you know, again, whether you're a parent or a student, you should develop a budget for college and for the application process in particular. Um, and you should agree with that um, or on that with either your student or your parents. So, um, you know, there, there should be that set budget. This is how much we plan on spending based on the schools, um, based on the, some of the research that we've done on those schools and the fees, 
you know, based on the school location. Um, and you can find a great college affordability tool at collegecost.ed.gov. And I do believe that I have that page up here um, to show you as well. So, um, so the uh, collegecost.ed.gov, as you can see on the top there, um, is also another wonderful, wonderful resource from the US Department of Education. Um, it goes into a, a college financing plan down here to uh, College Navigator, gives you tons of information as far as costs are concerned. Um, you know, um, if you go into, I believe it's the college financing plan, um, nope, I'm going to go back here, um, might be the College Navigator, and I apologize, I, uh, didn't actually pull the site here, the College Navigator, um, it goes, you, you can choose here based on the zip code, you can choose as far as the, the level that you want, so if you're just looking to get a bachelor's degree, or an associate's degree, or a more advanced degree, um, a four-year or two-year college, you can plug all that information in there, show results, and it will show you all sorts of um, universities and colleges that you should be able to find additional information for. Um, again, it's a wonderful resource preparing for your education here, some additional resources um, that would be incredibly, incredibly useful. So uh, definitely a page that you should uh, take note of. Um, so that you can go in and really kind of get some additional information um, when it comes to college costs as well. All right. Um, so there are different assessments that you can complete, um, you know, with between the, the college uh, career one stop, um, you know, and, and the, the value of those assessments can, can be, you know, priceless, really. Um, you know, you really kind of need to, again, determine your values and determine what is important to you before you actually start applying to, to colleges or decide where it is that you're going to go. So, you know, really kind of determining your values and, and being able to, to go into that path, um, you know, that your values and your interests takes you to will really kind of motivate you to go to work every day and give you that feeling of fulfillment and a great sense of satisfaction so that you want to go to work every day, right? So you'll also likely share those same values with your coworkers uh, once you, you determine that, that career path. Ultimately, being happier with your career choice, right? So by completing these assessments, um, it'll allow you to really discover your, 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 your true career options. And in doing so, you'll get a better idea of, of what path you should be following. Right. So once you start forming that vision, uh, you know, what steps you'll need to take um, will, to get there will depend on, on how big that vision is. Right. So whether you need to go to a university, you know, university is a lot of hard work with with very little supervision, um, you know, but it's meant for that higher learning. Uh, whereas you may decide to go to a junior college or a community college if you're opting for an associate's degree or a career path that does not require more than that two years of schooling. You know, there's, there's trade or vocational schools that are more career focused in the fields like healthcare or technology and are very skills-based learning. So, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you, you, you don't want to be a surgeon or, or an attorney, but you want to, to be a medical technician or a paralegal or a legal assistant, you know, so those trade and vocational certificate programs may give you an edge at that point. So uh, a lot of things to think about, right? And, and this is all before we actually, you know, get to the point of, of deciding what college we're going to go to. So very important um, to really kind of develop that, uh, that plan first. 
Um, so before you start applying to schools, find out those application deadlines and the fees for each and every one of those schools that you're considering. So it takes time to get the, the standardized test scores tabulated and mailed, and it takes time for school counselors and others providing those references. You know, so it takes time to gather all of that information. Um, you know, certainly look into, you know, what the instructions are for each and every one of those applications for each and every one of those schools that you, that you determine you may want to attend. So you're going to need to work with your high school. You're going to need to, to likely work with your, your uh, school counselor uh, for, for help gathering, you know, all of the transcripts and all of the documentation that is necessary. So, you know, um, you're also going to need to get, you know, those references. So you need to give people plenty of time for them to respond, um, you know, when, when you're asking for them. So you need to make sure to do your homework on each one of the universities or the colleges, whether it's community college or junior college, they're all going to take some time. So um, make sure that once you are going through that application process, that you keep track and keep a copy of all of the documents and all of the material that you're actually submitting or that you receive. Uh, very important that you get yourself very organized, um, whether it's you, you have multiple folders, uh, you know, and you can label them, um, you know, for each and every school, but, you know, certainly getting yourself organized. Um, and being able to keep track of everything is going to make a huge difference for you once you are actually in the application process. Okay. So if you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay for college, you've probably heard, you know, friends or family say, you know, there's scholarships out there, you just have to look for them. But if you've actually ever tried to look for scholarships, you know that finding the right ones can feel like looking for a needle in a haystack. Because believe it or not, there's over 5 million scholarships available that you can sift through for students here in the US. So it's a pretty, pretty huge haystack. So understandably, it can be very, very overwhelming. So, but obviously you wanna focus on free money first. So it's always best to exhaust any and all free financial aid options before you turn to like student loans and things of that nature. Um, what you can, you can start with is uh, there's plenty of applications out there um, available like goingmary.com, uh, going I believe is a website. Um, there's also MyScoli, which is, um, MyScoli is M-Y-S-C-H-O-L-L-Y. Um, or getmyfuture.org. So these are all types of like applications and websites where you can uh, find scholarships. Um, I find that myscoli.com is a wonderful, wonderful website. You establish an account. Um, and uh, once you establish that account and enter in all of your information, it will tell you what scholarships are available to you, when you need to apply for those, how you go ahead and apply. And it gives you, in many cases, the website to go to to actually apply for those. So um, again, goingmary.com, myscoli.com, or getmyfuture.org, I find to be all very useful, useful websites, um, or uh, I'm sorry, some of those are actual applications. Um, you know, and if you just search up in the app store, uh, whether you have an iPhone or, or, a, or a, a Samsung or, you know, whatever you have, if you go into your app store and look for scholarships, you should be able to find quite a few website or applications where you can find um, scholarship information as well. So grants are typically on a need basis. Um, for example, a federal grant is a form of financial assistance. So the US government, basically what happens is they redistribute um, resources to eligible recipients who can demonstrate the, the need, um, you know, or, or that there is need for, for funds. Um, they're usually on a first come first serve basis. So these can be like the Pell Grant, which is the largest and most common. Um, so the sooner you apply for grants, the better. 
So again, you want to focus on free money, right? Uh, you certainly don't want to leave money on the table. Um, and some things to consider when looking at financial aid is that it's meant to pay for the difference between the cost of school and what they determine you are able to pay. So important to, to know that. Um, and so we're going to watch a video here very quickly, um, which is just kind of the um, FAFSA overview, which we'll talk about um, once we watch the video here. So hopefully you can hear it. So again, um, the FAFSA, very important. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. So before each year of college, uh, as I explained, you would need to apply for that. And that would be each year. So if you're going to college for four years, you need to apply for it four times. Um, and you need to apply for it the year before, um, uh, you typically about the, the October before federal deadline is June 30th. So um, it's very important that you, that you are aware of that. Um, and again, this is to apply for any uh, federal grants, work study, um, you know, any, any student loans, federal student loans will also come up on there. So your college uses your FAFSA data to determine your federal aid eligibility. Um, and this is through many states and, and many, many colleges. So um, this is how they're going to award, uh, you know, any, any grants, any scholarships, um, you know, besides any scholarships that you already directly um, have obtained. So um, the expected family contribution, that EFC, that again is the difference between what the cost of going to school to that particular school is and what they determine you should be able to pay based on your income and the income that you've provided. So this would equal your financial need. So um, you know, in, in most um, U.S. colleges, students are eligible for the, the federal direct Stafford loan, um, which, you know, does not necessarily depend on your credit history or anything like that. But 
you'll need to start by creating the uh, FSA ID number and basically you're creating an account and you would create that at studentaid.gov. Um, so, you know, that's kind of just kind of summing up the, the video that we just watched. Make sure that you have all of your information. So you would need, again, your social security number, driver's license, um, your previous year's tax records um, for your parents if you are dependent, um, any assets, as well as the lists of schools that you're interested in attending as well. So um, Illinois Student Assistance Commission, or ISAAC, it's I-S-A-C, it's again, the Illinois Student Assistance Commission is a public organization that helps students and families get to college, and they offer free workshops, um, they offer help to assist in completing the FAFSA, um, or, or any alternative applications for, for Illinois financial aid. So um, definitely a good resource there as well. And again, that's the Illinois Student Assistance Commission or ISAAC um, is a, another great, great uh, resource for you to have. When you apply for financial aid, your school will likely include student loans, again, as part of your financial aid package. And it's important to understand what types of loans you are offered. So um, it's important that you read through that paperwork. Um, generally, there's two types of loans um, for, for student loans, federal and private. So, um, you know, really kind of knowing that difference um, is going to make a big difference on how you pay those back. So as you can see here, um, the federal loans, uh, typically you're going to um, have to do basically the same things that you would for private loans. The main difference with them is going to be the, the way that you have to repay those. So private loans are those um, stipulations, those, those repayment stipulations are going to be set by that private entity, whether that's a credit union or a bank um, or the school itself directly. Uh, whereas federal student loans, you typically are going to have um, very specific repayment options. And we're gonna watch um, another useful video here in regards to student loans. Right here. If you've taken out a federal student loan, there will come a time when you have to repay what you've borrowed. That time comes after you graduate, leave school, or drop below half-time enrollment. But don't worry, in most cases, you won't have to begin making payments right away. For instance, you won't have to start repaying your direct subsidized loan or direct unsubsidized loan for six months, and your federal Perkins loan begins repayment after nine months. If you have a plus loan, your loan enters repayment after your final disbursement, but you may be able to postpone your payments. Before your loan enters repayment, you will be contacted by a loan servicer. A loan servicer is an organization that manages loans and collects payments on behalf of the lender. On the loans you receive from the U.S. Department of Education, you will submit your payments to your loan servicer. If you have a Perkins loan from your school, you'll make payments to your school or your school's loan servicer. Your loan servicer can help you select the repayment plan that works best for you. There are different types of plans that you can choose based on the type of loan you received and how much you borrowed. For example, you may select a fixed monthly payment, but some people opt for a graduated repayment plan where payments start low and increase under two years. If you think you'll need a longer amount of time to pay back the loan, you may be eligible for an extended repayment plan. There are also options that base your loan payments on your income in order to help you better manage your debt. If you ever find yourself having difficulty making payments, contact your loan servicer immediately to discuss the options available to you. If you need to look up the contact information of your loan servicer, we have a great resource available. The National Student Loan Data System can provide your loan servicer's name and contact information, as well as other details about your loan. Visit www.nslds.ed.gov. If you're interested in estimating your monthly loan payments, or if you'd like more information, please visit studentaid.gov.
So studentaid.gov, again, a uh, wonderful, wonderful resource, obviously. Um, all sorts of information um, that you can um, look up as well. So once you apply for um, financial aid, your school will likely include, again, student loans as part of that financial package. Um, and, you know, uh, federal student loans are you know, funded by the federal government. So typically uh, payments aren't due until after you graduate, leave school or change your enrollment status to less than half time, meaning, um, you know, payments are, are deferred um, at that time while you're in school, you know, full time. Um, what that means is you're not making payments. So, so when we hear the deferred versus non-deferred um, student loans, deferred just means that you're not currently making payments on that. The interest rate typically on a federal loan is also fixed. And um, a lot of times it can be lower than what a private loan would offer you. So if you meet that financial requirement, you may qualify for like a subsidized loan also, which means the government pays the interest while you are in school. So um, very important to kind of know the difference between that deferred, non-deferred, subsidized, and unsubsidized. Again, deferred versus non-deferred just, just says whether you're currently having to make payments or whether those are going to have to be made later on, meaning you're in school full-time, you do not have to be making payments as long as you are in school full time. Again, these would be for federal loans. Um, now the subsidized, again, the subsidized would mean that the government is making, is paying that interest, okay? So, so that means that the loan is not accruing interest when you're not making those payments versus unsubsidized means that even if you have a federal loan and it's unsubsidized, even though you're not making payments currently, that interest is accruing. So when you do start making payments, you're going to owe more than, for example, the you know, $20,000 that you initially took out. So if you're, take, if you're taking out a federal loan for $20,000 and you start that loan today and it's unsubsidized, but the payments are deferred, that means as long as I'm in school full time for the next four years, this $20,000, I don't have to pay back because it's deferred, right? I don't have to make any payments, but it's unsubsidized, which means the interest is accruing on it, okay? So in four years, when I get out of school and I have to start making payments, I don't just owe that $20,000. I owe $20,000 plus four years worth of interest depending on your interest rate, depending on whether you've made any payments on this at all, that could mean that now you owe, I don't know, uh, $30,000 instead of the 20 that you initially took out. So that's really kind of the difference. And I think that that tends to be a little bit confusing or these tend to be terms that we hear a lot, um, but we're not quite sure what they mean. So um, I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a clearer picture on, uh, you know, what that deferred versus non-deferred and subsidized versus unsubsidized loans may mean. All right. Um, now, uh, private student loans, again, these are non-federal loans, which means they're made by a private lender. Again, it could be a bank, a credit union, uh, a, maybe a state agency or the school itself. So uh, again, the terms and conditions are not set by the law, whereas a federal student loan, these are set by law, right? They're set by the federal government. Um, typically the repayment plans on a private loan are, are not necessarily as flexible, right? So you don't hear about a um, unsubsidized or a deferred loan many times when, when you have private student loans. So typically, a private student loan, you're going to start accruing interest from day one, and you're going to be expected to start making payments um, pretty much right away. Um, the deferrals typically on private student loans are on a case by case basis. Um, you know, so it's not to say that you cannot defer uh, payments on a private loan, um, but typically that's going to be for 
um, some sort of an emergency. And it's going to be very short term deferments. Um, you know, we can defer the payment for three months or two months um, because you, you know, had a death in the family or there was a job loss or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, uh, life changing event typically has to take place. Um, so just be aware that, you know, the private student loans, um, those guidelines are all set, again, by that particular entity that is giving you that loan. Um, it's also going to typically have um, a more variable interest rate, uh, meaning it's going to depend on your credit worthiness. So, um, you know, typically they're going to pull credit, a credit report, they're going to want to see, um, you know, the, the income documentation, which you also have to provide for, for the government or the federal loans. Um, but they're going to be very based on you qualifying for those particular loans um, as well. So, all right. So once you have an idea, obviously, of your path and you create kind of that vision, uh, you know, maybe create a vision board for your future, um, you know, you, you have to really kind of put a plan together, right? Um, savings is, is a critical life skill. So I urge you or your parents um, to certainly open up a savings account if you haven't uh, got one already to, again, start a budget for that um, you know, application process and obviously for the whole school process as well. You know, there's plenty of savings accounts that are available out there, and it could be as simple as you open up a savings account with you know, with a credit union, with your local credit union, or it could be you open a 529 plan, which is, you know, the, the state sponsored plan. So, you know, Bright Star uh, tends to be the, the more common one that we hopefully all heard about, um, but really kind of designing that, that savings for college. And um, there is such a website as savingforcollege.com also has a ton of information, is a wonderful, wonderful website um, that you can look up to, to kind of uh, look at all of those uh, savings plans. And it really does talk mostly about the 529 uh, savings plans that um, you might be eligible for um, in your state. So um, some good information there as well. Other than that, um, that's really all I have. Uh, I was telling Sadia before we got started that this is a, a little bit of a, of a shorter uh, presentation, but certainly if you have any questions for me, I would be more than happy to answer those. I know that uh, there was one question in regards to the airline pilots, the comment that I made earlier. Um, military is, is not a requirement to be an airline pilot. Um, but um, I'm sure that certainly it, it helps if you were in the military and uh, learned uh, aviation, but it is not necessarily a requirement other than that. Any other questions, um, comments?